Hey guys, you're watching the Best Practices Show where we take a look at the best business practices from the best dental practices all across the country. And if your practice is growing, you're looking for an option to help facilitate that growth and it might include an associate. And so today we're going to be talking about the new trends in hybrid associate agreements with my attorney, an attorney that works with a lot of great dental practices, David Cohen. So don't miss this. Grab a pen and hit the share button. We'll see you in a second. Hey guys, welcome back to the Best Practices Show. Thank you so much for watching and thanks for all of your comments and feedback and just having a, a great time with this uh, and uh, trying to bring you the great content that you guys are asking for. And today is no exception. One of the things that people call us and ask all the time is how do I structure an associate agreement? What are some of the considerations? And even when talking to young dentists, they always ask, how should I approach the associate agreement? And there's a brand new trend that's happening and it's the hybrid associate agreements. And I've got one of the world's experts on how all that works, David Cohen, today. So do me a favor, um, as you're watching the live broadcast, we are shooting this live. So as you have questions, this is a hot topic. And if you have something specific you want to ask, add it to the feed and I'll ask David directly while he's on the show and we'll get the answer from him um, straight from the top. And then also, if you're watching these later on after the live broadcast, continue to add them to the feed and you'll see David will respond to them and give you the help that you need because I want you to get the most out of these whenever you're watching these. So my guest today, I'll do my introduction. I've known him for a very long time. He actually does a majority of the legal stuff for us and a lot of the great uh, dentists that we coach throughout the Seattle Study Club. And uh, I've gotten to know you through the Seattle Study Club and you're just, you're one of the hardest working people I know and you have unbelievable customer service. And that's hard to say about somebody in the legal profession, but uh, uh, I just appreciate you. You're just an incredibly uh, valuable resource for everybody we coach. And so, David, thanks for being on. So people don't know you. David, can you give us a little background on who you are, how you grew up in dentistry? Obviously, your dad, Michael Cohen, is one of my mentors and great friends. But how did you get involved in this? And tell us a little bit about what you do. Yeah, thanks for asking. So I uh, grew up in the world of dentistry, obviously, with my father being a periodontist and came to build relationships with dentists and knew that I always wanted to work with them in some capacity. Decided that uh, dental school wasn't for me. In fact, I played basketball all through college and thought maybe there'd be a career there and quickly realized in college that I wasn't gonna play professionally and had to do something else. So I decided to go to law school but knew that I always wanted to connect back with dentists and uh, therefore I started a law firm um, that specializes in helping dentists and specialists from a legal business transactional standpoint. Um, and what that means is contracts, uh, negotiations, and um, really with purchases and sales of businesses, associate agreements, and real estate matters. Mm -hmm. And like I said, you just do a great job. Now, I want to talk about why this topic is so important because this is a hot topic. And you tell me if you agree with these um, statistics that we hear. We hear that between 70 and 90 percent of associates ships and partnerships fail. I don't know if that's true. I'd love to know. And then also these can get pretty sticky if you don't have the right thinking before all of this goes to paper. So can you add any context to that and why this topic is so important in dentistry? Yeah, I think dentistry is a relationship business. And so um, relationships are critical. And when I see failure in partnerships or in associateships, it's not typically over something like money, even though one would think that might be the primary reason why uh, they're, they're, not, they're not successful when they're not successful. But the answer is it's the relationship and making sure that um, it's a nice fit and that the terms of the relationships are outlined clearly in writing in a contract. And I always tell clients of mine that the best partnerships are those where the documents are signed and the partners never pick them up ever again 
because they're just on the same page. That also holds true with really any type of agreement in the transactional world, and that includes associate agreements. It, most great associate ships that work out, the doctors sign the contract, they have the same understanding, and they never pick it up again. Mm -hmm. That said, there may come a time to pick an agreement up again, and because not every partnership and not every associateship is uh, perfect, and in those circumstances, it's really important to have a contract in place that memorializes the key terms to the deal. Yeah, absolutely. And we're going to talk about that when we talk about pitfalls, because it it uh, it can really work against you when you don't have these in writing. Now, define what a hybrid agreement. Can you explain what that is and how it works? Good question. So the evolution of associate agreements is is now, at least with my firm, uh, pushing toward a more of a hybrid structure. And when I say hybrid structure, what I mean is a fusion between your typical employment agreement that simply just governs the employment of a doctor and that between that and an actual full-on purchase. And there has to be something in the middle because what's happening with the evolution of these deals is that associates are coming out of school or even have some years of experience and they want ownership and they want that commitment. And um, they're very entrepreneurial. And so that's just that's their desire. And if they don't have an idea that that's going to happen down the road, if things work out properly, then they may look for another opportunity. And on the flip side, we have a lot of doctors that are now looking to potentially retire. Right. And they have a financial plan and they have a certain total plan set for their retirement. It hampers their ability to optimize that plan when they bring in an associate who they feel they're committed to and they invest time and money into the whole process and then that associate maybe leaves them for another opportunity. And so what I've always asked myself is how can cr we create some sort of a hybrid agreement between regular associateship and between ownership that makes everybody feel a little more comfortable about the situation but also isn't a full on commitment because the fact of the matter is, like I mentioned, a lot of these partnerships or associateships fail because of relationships and without getting to know somebody and not only from a personal standpoint, but also how the practice works and how production is. If you're the, the, the practice owner, how well the associate produces um, or if you're the associate, how good of a fit the practice is and how much potential there is. Um, those are key factors that people think about and need to explore before the full on commitment occurs. And so what I've been doing more often is drafting hybrid agreements that say this is an employment agreement. However, we're going to have some stipulations where people are going to put some skin in the game, so to speak, where there's a commitment. Um, and then if things don't work out, then there might be some consequences. So to elaborate further on that, let's say an associate comes into a practice and they put up a certain, a certain portion of money monthly that they're receiving as compensation um, to put toward ownership down the road. And it's a great way for them to build equity, so to speak, because they can apply at least you know, some of that, if not all of that, to the purchase price when they buy in and they get used to making payments like they will on their bank note when they have to buy in. So it gets them in the mode and right. gets them ahead of the game. But they're also putting skin in the game and a commitment where they have to be darn sure that this is the opportunity they're looking for and they have to be serious about it. Because if they don't, they're probably gonna lose some money. And then on the flip end, you have the practices that oftentimes will commit to putting up some money that says, that says hey, if, if we back out on you, mm -hmm. then you're going to be able to get our money that we have put up maybe in an escrow account or something like that. And that also holds the practice accountable so the associate doesn't have to waste their time, so to right. speak. And obviously, there are conditions surrounding that escrow situation and, and the distribution of the funds through, through escrow to make sure that, um, you know, if, if an associate is putting up money 
that they don't get screwed, so to speak, because the employer knew all along they didn't want to keep them, but they just racked up this money over a bunch of months and said, yeah, you know, this isn't working out. And by the way, I'm keeping your money. So there have to be some stipulations around that, that perhaps if the practice terminates the associate for cause, which would maybe entail um, losing license or committing a felony or something like that, then the associate doesn't get their money back. Or if the associate walks out on the practice, then they don't get their money back. But if the associate's committed and they're just terminated voluntarily by the practice, that um, that they get their money back. And if the practice also put up money, it would get the practice's money as well. Mm -hmm. um, so there have to be some parameters around to make sure that the parties are protected. And then mm -hmm. obviously it works on the flip side as well. So that that's the essence of the hybrid agreement. Um, it, it makes the associate feel like they're somewhat of an owner. They may even get paid a little bit of an ownership share because a lot of times these associates can't afford to put up money monthly when they're just getting their normal salary or percentage of collection, so to speak. But if they get a small extra piece from the practice, but then is thrown back into being um, that, that, that escrow payment, so to speak, then that often can work. So the, the cash flow of the practice, what they're getting paid, that all has to be taken into consideration. This is just a general idea that you look at and then you work backwards and try to fit the pieces in as they're appropriate for the specific practice. Yeah, absolutely. I have so many questions on this too. Now, we talked about this. One of the myths, and it's probably really clear that you have to put this, is that young dentists often think they're going to have guaranteed ownership. And can you talk about that? Like, you have to make it very clear that this is not guaranteed ownership. This is just very much a win win with skin in the game, with provisions in the event this doesn't work out. Is that correct? That's correct. And when I lecture at the schools, I often tell them that as well, that there are methods of accelerating your ownership process without just having a simple employment agreement when you leave school here. But um, that doesn't mean that it's guaranteed because the bottom line is this. You don't know that this is a good fit for you. You don't want to commit yourself to something that may not be a good fit for you. And on the flip side, the practice certainly doesn't know you well enough and doesn't want to commit to you. And going off on that note of knowing well enough, so to speak, um, that is a dangerous, um, dangerous thing to say because I have often people who have pre-existing relationships in life that feel like they know somebody well enough, but they've never worked with them from a business standpoint. And so I get all the time from people, from doctors that call me and they say, well, we know each other. I, you know, I've known this person since they were growing up or whatever it might be. And so we have that existing relationship and we know it's going to work. Um, or I even have, you know, on the, on the practice partnership type of level, I have people coming, you know, that are younger perhaps or even older that um, want to do a partnership together, a startup, but they've never worked together. Either way. It's, it's important that um, the parties get to know each other, I think, before there's a commitment. Right, right. And, you know, business is business. It's one of those things that you have to have. We've seen fathers and sons, um, things go in the wrong direction, too, just because uh, a lot of there isn't a lot of clarity around how this is going to work. And a lot of it ends up being. Uh, related to money and other things like that. So now other things, uh, as far as the non-compete and non-solicitation, how does that play into a hybrid agreement? Is that an important component of this? I would imagine. That a, yeah, that is a important uh, component. It's really an important component of any um, associate agreement with the caveat that the non-compete, non-solicitation have to be permitted in the state that the client is in. Okay. So... Uh, you know, we work with clients all over the country and we see different rules in different states regarding non-competes and their enforceability. So there are some states, for instance, where non-competes are quite enforceable, where somebody's selling goodwill in a business. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to an employment situation, uh, they're not because states don't like restraint on trade. They don't like telling someone they can't make a living. Right. So um, they can be very strict on that. And typically non-competes are not enforceable unless they meet a series of exceptions. But again, you know, really that depends on um, the state that they're in. So yes, it's an important component. If it's legal in the state that they're in, it should be in the agreement. 
and there's a few reasons why it should be. And this is more speaking on the employer side. Uh, number one, um, it's important to protect the integrity of the practice. Number two, the marketability of the practice to be able to sell it is, is per potentially damaged without an associate agreement that has a non-compete. So um, it's really key to have an agreement in the first place, but that's because it stipulates all of these things such as non-competes that are really uh, important. And I have an example of a situation, a deal that I'm recently working on where um, the seller of the practice is looking to sell to my client buyer. My client buyer has worked in that practice for a significant period of time. And so it's a natural fit for my client to buy into the practice. And this is obviously getting off on the tangent of purchasing and not the associateships, which we'll get back to, um, but they kind of link. And that's the point of, right. of explaining this. Um, and my, my client does not have a, a, an associate agreement. They don't have a non-compete. They don't have non-solicitation. They don't have intellectual property restrictions. And so because of that, if, this doctor can't sell to my client, their practice is probably not going to be marketable to anyone because people don't want to sign on to a purchase agreement and pay for tons of goodwill and then have the associate that's working there open up a practice right next door uh, because they didn't have a non-compete. That could severely diminish the goodwill that they're pur purportedly buying. And as everyone knows, the sellers of practices always want to allocate a ton to goodwill. So um, if they want, the, you know, they can't have their cake and eat it too. If they want all that goodwill, then they have to make sure that that is adequately transferred. And it's tough to do that when the associate can go next door and, and work. So it's, it's boiling this down to the key um, uh, moral of the story, have an agreement that's really key. And then obviously, once you have that agreement, make sure that the non-compete, et cetera, is stipulated. Right. So this to the next level, um, when you have this hybrid type of agreement, associates often, and, and fairly so, may say, well, because this is kind of a discovery period for us, um, I don't want the non-compete to kick in for, say, three months. Because how much damage can a brand new associate really do to the goodwill of a practice in that short period of time, yet if they work a day or two and it doesn't work out, then... Um, they could be restricted significantly from working. So um, that that's a request that often, on the flip side, the new associates would ask for in connection with the non-competes. Yeah, absolutely. Now this is a win-win on both sides. You know, I certainly don't want this to be slanted towards the dentist um, presenting this to a young, you know, an established dentist to a young dentist coming into the practice. It's it's truly a, a mutual win-win. Now, a couple things uh, because I do get these questions every week. I get them more from the young dentist than the established dentist, and we do have a lot of young dentists watching these. Can you define goodwill? Because they'll ask me, what does that mean? Like, why, why am I paying so much for goodwill? Because you mentioned it. Yeah, good question, and and I do. Uh, that's a good point. This does go both sides, and the point of this. Uh, conversation from my end is to show what each side is thinking, uh, right. not necessarily say that one is better than the other. Um, and, and like I mentioned, it's really cool and critical for an associate to want to put some restrictions on that non-compete going in to make sure that they have maybe three months of time where they can explore and make sure it's a good fit before they subject themselves to those parameters of a non-compete. But, but going back to your question, um, that you just asked regarding, um, you know, the goodwill situation when they buy a practice, goodwill is an intangible asset. And so just going back to the foundation of what assets are sold in an asset sale, there are tangible assets sold and there are intangible assets sold. Tangible assets would consist of, say, furniture, fixtures, equipment, supplies. Intangible uh, assets would be those that you can't necessarily touch or feel like um, goodwill. And goodwill is very tough to place a definitive value on because it's intangible. Mm -hmm. And so what off, I, I don't do valuations of practices, so obviously I, I can't speak to the full extent of how these valuations come to light, uh, but, uh, but goodwill is definitely usually tacked on after the other tangible assets are actually valued and then the rest will go to goodwill 
Um, in an ideal world for an asset allocation, you would simply look at what everything really is worth. You get the equipment appraised, what's that worth it? What, what are the supplies worth? And then you add those up and whatever's left would often go to goodwill. But that's the, the legal reality. The practical reality is that those numbers are often manipulated because sellers get a, a, a better um, tax break if they sell more intangible and it's better for buyers from a tax standpoint um, to have assets that are allocated towards tangible. So goodwill, how do you value that? I think it's a combo to answer your question. It's number one, what's left after the tangible assets are actually valued? And then number two, what gets manipulated through the process by the parties? It's just kind of become an industry standard that um, people tend to do to try to make it fair or reasonable for both sides if they can do that. Yeah, but good yeah, stuff. I, I, I don't value practices, so that would be the best qu person would be a CPA to answer that. Uh, well, and I that's why I dished the questions to you, because if you're a dentist watching this, you know, a lot of the, your thinking is scientifically based. So this is one of those things that's just kind of off the grid. Like, how do you put a value on something you can't touch or measure? And that's interest. It's always an interesting question for us. Now, go back. Now, when it comes to uh, the new trend of hybrid associate agreements, and I know you're going to say, I know what you're going to say, it depends. But how? What's a typical term for this? I mean, because I do get these questions. How long should we be in this um, this process? And should it be 24 months? Should it be 12 months? What do you typically see? Yeah, you're right. It does depend on the practice, but I would say on average, it's about a year. About a year. Uh, you okay. know, I have clients that do a six month trial and then they push into a to a partnership. They, they Maybe they did some personality testing and they really felt like six months was enough to get to know one another and know one another's production and all that kind of stuff. And then I have those that are two years, but usually I would say it's about a year. A year is a great period of time for everyone to learn each other, learn their production, learn if it's really going to work. Um, and so that's, that's the typical term that I see. Okay. And then anything in these hybrid agreements that we're not used to seeing that you'd say, be aware of this, you know, what's unique to a hybrid agreement that we're just not accustomed to seeing? Well, I, I think the, the most unique thing about these agreements is most employment agreements do not govern the, um, the purchase into a practice. And the reason why is because an employment agreement governs employment and contracts typically govern what they govern. So if you just put language in a contract that says, well, if the parties both like each other and then they decide later that maybe they think this is a good fit, then maybe they'll decide that they'll have further discussions to possibly and potentially, you know, talk down the road about being together as partners. And that's not, that's fluffy and it's not legally binding language. And as attorneys, we like to put language in contracts that's actually legally binding um, because obviously that, that intent of the parties to be partners could be known within one another verbally without having it in a contract, which really isn't going to have any greater effect than that verbal confirmation to one another. Uh, mm -hmm. I think some associates like to see that just for their, and, and, and also on the flip side, some employers like to see it if they want a commitment, just so they know it makes them feel better. But from a legal standpoint, and obviously I'm a lawyer, I don't think that it has, it, it does much difference. So how that's changed during the hybrid model is now we have at least one side, if not both putting up money, possibly to an escrow account on say a monthly basis where they have to put skin in the game and have a commitment and know that they're going to be doing that before they go into the contract to know that they have that commitment and they would never do that and enter into the agreement without being serious about the other side. And once they are, then things seem to flow a little bit better. And that's, that's the unique thing that I think you would see in these agreements as opposed to your typical associate agreement. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the, are these hard to put together? Are they fairly easy? Um, can you speak to that at all? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that they're, I think if, if an attorney is working on the deal that has experience with these types of agreements, it should be pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, the details uh, will determine how difficult or complex the deal is. Also, if an attorney that is proficient in this 
sends it over to the other side and then that attorney isn't familiar with this structure or with dental, it may take them longer to figure that out. And it doesn't mean they can't, but it just make them take it make them take longer and the process may be a little more arduous because of that. So it, 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 the, the parties involved do make a difference and the details of the agreement make a difference. But for the most part, it can be a pretty smooth process. Yeah, it's just great how, you know, I, I, I'm always looking for the win-win in this whole process. So let's do this. I want you to walk us through this because if somebody's watching this, they're like, okay, David, just give me the treatment plan. From your perspective, let's speak to both sides, not only the selling dentist, but to a young dentist. You know, if you were to put together three bullet points on both sides to make this a win-win, what would you say are considerations as a selling dentist do these three things? Uh, in the hybrid agreement, you mean? Yeah, in the hybrid yeah, agreement. So, so, so number one, um, if we're talking about fairness in, in all worlds, it would be that both sides commit to putting up some money in escrow on a monthly basis or quarterly or whatever they decide so that each side has skin in the game. Each now, I'm going to ask you this question because you'll get this question. What, what percentage? Like how much? And it, it, right. I know it depends, but. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it does depend on the cash flow of the practice and what the practice can, what the associate can afford, what the practice can afford to pay, maybe a little bit extra that they know okay. is coming back to them in escrow. Um, but um, so, so, yeah, it, it really does depend on what, what can be afforded under the practice that is being worked in. Um, as long as it's an amount that makes the parties more serious, that's really what matters. It's not so much the amount of money, it's that in the particular circumstances of the parties, what is an amount that is going to incentivize them to be serious about the, the, the process and right. where they would feel that they would be hurt if they lost that money in the process. And of course, there are things outside of money. There's time that that can never be brought back. But um, you do the best you can, and money, I think, is 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 a key way. So, if the if it's in fairness, if both parties are putting up the money, if the seller back, if the you know the the ultimate seller backs out, buyer gets the money back, buyer backs out, seller keeps the money. Um, that that's an equitable way. Mm -hmm. I think that that's one. Um, number two, going back to the non-compete, I think it benefits the seller to have a non-compete, but it also you know, benefits the, the eventual buyer, that's the associate, to have at least some leeway to say, this doesn't kick in for three months because I need to feel this out and I'm going to be incredibly strapped if, um, if this doesn't work out and it's a short period of time and then I have to, you know, 10 miles or whatever it might be to have to go outside of to find somewhere else to work. So mm -hmm. that would probably be the second thing. And then I think from a th the third thing that would I think make um, both parties happy would be um, figuring out a term and figuring out what works for both sides regarding how, how, what is the expectation? Manage that expectation of when this ownership structure would occur because the associate coming in um, may have a certain perception. And if that's different than the practice, that can cause significant issues down the road. And so you want to manage expectations from the beginning, create a win-win where both sides are happy and satisfied with the timing of when the, 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 part, the purchase would occur. Right. Absolutely. And then the, the, what I would, I'm going to add this one, and I know you've talked to her all of this has to be in writing because, and is it, is it fair to say this is cliche dentists don't read contracts? You know, <laughs> it, it's a joke, but it's really not a joke. Would you agree? I, I would agree that uh, I, you know, I can't say that all dentists don't read them, but I would say that, uh, you know, definitely there are some that are many that don't, mm -hmm. and it's important to read them. It's important to be knowledgeable about what you have Talk to your attorney about what's in there if it's tough for you to understand legalese, uh, but have a contract. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the key. Have an agreement before anything else. If there's one lesson, have an agreement. And then obviously make sure that whatever the intent of the parties is, is memorialized therein. Yeah, absolutely. And then lastly, I'm always asking you this question because I'm curious, because you deal with 
ones that work out really well. And then you see these agreements and relationships that fail. If you were to narrow down, like this is the legal part, this is the written part, this, but what really makes an associateship a work? Like I, and a hybrid agreement sounds like a wonderful idea, but really when you step back and look at this, cause if I'm a dentist watching this, sum it up for me, what makes these work? Relationships, relationships make it work. That's first and foremost. And I think the practice needs to do a significant amount of due diligence on who is coming into the practice to make sure it's a good fit. And then I also think one thing that's overlooked for the associates that are coming in is this isn't just an interview process by the practice to the associate. It's an interview process for the associate to the practice to make sure it's a good fit. Now, of course, you have your outliers and people who don't have a choice. They have to have, find work. They may not have opportunities otherwise where maybe it's a rural area of the country where there's a, a limited amount of opportunity. And, and th th those are obviously exceptions to the rule um, because sometimes people need to make a living and need to dive into something even if it might not feel like it's the best fit. Obviously, I don't recommend that, but people have their own um, circumstances that they need to make sure that they're satisfying. But right. in general, it's an interview process for both parties, all things being equal and considered. And people coming into practices need to interview to make sure that that's the right practice for them and right opportunity down the road. And then obviously, same thing that comes uh, you know, from the practice. And it's not 100% that it's going to work out, even if both parties do a ton of due diligence, but it, it, it significantly increases the chance for it to be successful if the parties do dil due diligence on each other, ask the right questions, hang out potentially in a non-office environment, go to dinner, um, really get to know each other and their families. I think that's what creates the biggest win-win uh, because relationships are really the key to keep things together. Because if there's a good relationship, even if there's an issue, the parties have the mentality to work it out as opposed to make it polarizing. Yeah, absolutely. So, and a big piece of this, even if you're a young dentist, is you have to have a transition plan. And I say this all the time, I don't care if you're 32, there has to be a transition plan in place because some young dentists say, I don't need that just yet. Well, in the unfortunate incident you pass or you get disabled, I mean, there's always got to be something in place. We call it the 100 day plan that something's got to happen in these 100 days. Doesn't always include an associate, but if you're a mature dentist looking for this, I think it's important to start the search. It's always be in the search because here's what I get. People call me and they go, I need an associate and they're on a one month time frame. You know, like you can't yeah. put yourself in a situation where you're trying to find somebody in 30 days because what you end up doing is locking in with only one person and you want to be constantly feeling this out. Would you agree? So, so, so here's the question I get, where do I start? I'm a dentist. I, you know, I'm 59. What do I do? Where do I start looking for an associate? And then how do I talk to a young dentist about a hybrid agreement? Do you have any suggestions on that? Yeah, I do. So uh, I think lecturing at schools is a really cool opportunity for dentists that want to get to know younger doctors and that may want to have some options for associates. It doesn't have to be as part of the faculty. There are lunch and learns that doctors can do at these at the local dental schools where they get to, you know, pr provide a lecture, but then all it's short, 30 minutes, 30, 45 minutes but then get to know people, build relationships. So they build their own pool of people that they can help, um, you know, help themselves pick from. That's right. one cool way to, to, to build more relationships, to know who might be able to be a good candidate in their practice. And then they'll put themselves in a position of power because they'll have options. And as you just mentioned, sometimes someone needs someone 30 days and they have one option. So mm -hmm. that would help them. It also helps with the community. And then once they find the right candidate, then um, they also can talk to that candidate about the hybrid structure, which the candidate is probably going to be thrilled about because anybody out of school is typically pretty entrepreneurial and eager, and they want to at least explore the opportunity to have ownership on the horizon as opposed to just straight uh, employment. So, and then, you know, obviously other ways that dentists can, can meet doctors, there are professionals out there that, um, that can uh, source that they have pools of associates that they can source to put into these practices and they're sort of matchmakers. 
Um, there's companies that are brokers, but there are also some that um, literally are just staffing agencies for dentists. Mm -hmm. So you do a good job. So there's, there's, those are probably the best ways. Awesome. Awesome, buddy. I really appreciate this. And you're always, like I said, bringing great information to us and the trends and what's happening and making it easy on both sides. Now, if I'm a dentist watching this, whether I be young or mature, and I'm like, I need some help, where do I start? Um, how do we get a hold of you? How would I reach out to you? How would I get your information? Where can I find you? So you can find me um, on the web at www.cohenlawfirm.com plc.com so david at c o h e n l a w f i r m p l l c.com and also um, I'm always happy to be a resource they can call me 972-379-7513 I became an attorney to help people I'm never the type that is going to turn someone away that has a few questions and just wants to chat and, uh, and start to build a relationship that they can use as a resource just to bounce ideas off. I'm always happy to do that as well. Yeah. And I'll just say this. You're one of the hardest working men I know and responsive. So I love Appreciate it. And this is what Jerry Gottlieb just said. Amazing. Everybody needs a David Cohen. And I would agree. So thank you, buddy. Okay. Appreciate it. <laughs> so stay on for a second uh, while we say goodbye to everybody else uh, I've got a whole bunch of other things I want to buy but uh, thank you guys for watching really appreciate you tuning in today if you enjoyed this episode do me a favor just hit the share button and we'd love to hear more suggestions that you have for either, either David have, I'm going to have him back on a whole bunch of other topics or things you want to see keep sending them to us and uh, until we see you next time keep watching the best practices show you guys have a great rest of your day